Hello and welcome to the Carousel Podcast. Today I have with me Athenian Stranger. Many of you will be very familiar with him and his awesome spaces about philosophy. Athenian I would describe as a pursuer of human excellence, both in the physical and the mental realms. He's a bodybuilder extraordinaire, very advanced in that sphere from what I can tell and from what I've heard from other podcasts. And then simultaneously, you kind of use the same approach to your comprehensive knowledge of philosophy and of the classic works from history. So you're sort of uh, tackling human excellence from, from both angles. And there's actually a third category, which is handwriting, because you have amazing handwriting. <laughs> Yeah, I actually, I actually had uh, people attack me when I post those notes and they say that I have like e-girl handwriting or something like that. So You have amazingly good handwriting, which is, yeah, I don't think, hey, there's nothing wrong with it. I wish I had good handwriting. I think it's nice. I think it goes with your overall like pursuit of aesthetic perfection. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I dealt with teaching for so long. I got so tired of trying to read the handwriting of most students. And I just got to the point where I told him I wouldn't even grade it if I couldn't, if I had to even attempt a struggle to read it, I just wasn't going to. Um, and so that's, I just started writing in print myself. I never really liked cursive or anything. So It's one of those things that it's like, like as a man, you're supposed to be like, yeah, I don't care if my handwriting sucks. But actually, like when I go and look back in my terrible handwriting, <clears throat> it is kind of shameful. It's like, I can't figure out how to just like make this look good. <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing um anyway so you you have a i i don't know um yeah i don't know exactly what your history is but i and what you're comfortable sharing and what you're not but currently you have a project called underground university um do you want to just talk a little bit about that and and everything you're doing in terms of your spaces yeah we're gonna um, get into nietzsche sorry we're going we're getting into nietzsche after that <laughs> yeah no um so the underground university is that's that's my thing and the thing about it is that i i tried to keep myself as absolutely distant from it as possible because it's strictly set up to be a resource free from all ideology uh and just provide templates of uh course instruction from the great books uh examples of the ordering that you should read the books, for instance, for an introductory course, an intermediate course, an advanced level course, uh, through all of the great books, if one were to receive a solid education in the great books for political philosophy. Uh, I also have the Substack there. Uh, we've been, we're starting something new with fathers and sons coming up. Um, now, that being said, I also am about to launch a, a website that I'm, I'm going to really throw myself a lot more into which i think would be really good uh, because that's where i'll put my spaces and things like that uh so I'll, like i said i'll have much more of like the athenian stranger that people see in spaces and on the timeline um in this forthcoming website that i should launch here in about two weeks now so that that's actually i'm very very excited about that i'm going to do entire uh, spaces on great books for fathers and sons to read additional uh, content for my various spaces, uh, an archive of all of them and everything. So, so I'm excited about that. That's, that's really cool. So you, you're downloading the spaces. Yeah, that's, and it's taking forever because uh, when you get your data from Twitter, they just send it to you in this like enormous jumble, no titles to anything. And so I've had to go through and listen, re-listen to my spaces to figure out which just long enough to figure out which space is which and that's painful for me because i i never listen to myself uh, <laughs> I, I usually never i usually never go back and read anything i've written uh, that was sort of the funny thing about grad school is you know you all, all i did was write term papers uh but once i turned them in i never read i never reread them i never went back and visited them uh, i never tried to edit them to publish them or anything i just uh you know, thoughts change I'm, and i'm so hyper critical about my own ideas and the perfectionism that i want to be there that it would just end up taking forever so i just usually never look back so it's been painful listening to my spaces because i constantly think yeah i could explain that a whole lot better and probably use the word uh and um a lot less but uh how you know, long have you been doing it 
Um, well, Twitter, I just joined Twitter, uh, like in January of 2021, I think. So, so I was there when spaces first started, um, which I, which is kind of a big deal, I, I guess, because that's the strange thing about Twitter is you get so many new people coming and going and it's, uh, you know, you, everyone has a kind of learning curve to it and all that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess two years now, so, but that still makes me very, very new. Uh, no, given very that. new. Yeah, no, extremely. Yeah. I, what I would say with the voice thing is you will get used to it. And same with uh, Peachy Keenan, who I just had on here. She's about as old as you on Twitter. And she was telling me the same thing. I can't stand my voice. And you guys, first of all, you have an incredible voice. So of all people, <laughs> you're the last person who should be out here saying that because you sound better than pretty much everybody. <clears throat> And then uh, also that totally goes away. Like you'll you'll become like addicted to it. Like the more you hear it, the the more it'll just go away, and you'll feel the total opposite. Like I I hate my own voice, obviously, but after just years and years of listening to it, because I had another podcast for like four years before this one, uh, I just now like I don't have that flinch feeling anymore. You know that yeah. it kind of like yeah. disappears. Um. So before we get into Nietzsche, what? Uh, and sorry, I know you say Nietzsche. So excuse me if me saying Nietzsche is annoying, but is there oh, is it definitely yeah. Nietzsche? <laughs> no, that's just, <laughs> well, that's funny because the, the German pronunciation, uh, any word that has an E at the end is an uh, 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 but, but you have to draw lines because I don't speak German well at all. Uh, I just read it. And so it, it, it becomes one of those silly things when you start criticizing people for proper pronunciation or anything, because it's like, look, you know, are you native German? Uh, you know, did you did you live there for an extended period of time? You know, it just just be, it becomes sort of an elitist kind of thing where it's like, look, uh, I'll leave that to the the you know the full time academics, and you know, I'm just here to talk with my friends about fun stuff, uh, and I could give a shit whether we pronounce things right or wrong. <laughs> we have the ideas, and that's all that matters. So. Totally, exactly. I I couldn't agree more. So before that, though, what is the Athenian stranger? Oh, so I I got the name from the platonic dialogue that I, I did my uh, PhD dissertation on, which is Plato's laws. It's his longest dialogue and the main character, Athenian, the Athenian stranger, uh, that's, that's his name uh, in the dialogue. And it's a, it's a sort of thought experiment of what, it, what it would be like if Socrates had taken Crito's offer to abscond from Athens uh, and go away uh, using his friends to, you know, bribe the jurors and stuff. And what it, what it becomes is a long discussion primarily about education. It's a, it's a revisiting of Plato's Republic, but this time the difference is that the city they're talking about in speech, the, the best city in speech is the best one that can actually come into being. So it's no longer this, city and speech that is deliberately not going to come into being in the Republic uh, because it has to take into consideration what we would otherwise call the, the facts on the ground, right? People as they really are, uh, not these ideal circumstances. Uh, and so what happens especially is that the philosopher King gets replaced by the supervisor of the education, which is the equivalent of placing a kindergarten teacher in charge of the most important office in the entire city. Uh, that's how important education is. And so that really defines, for the most part, my account on Twitter is primarily concerned with education, primarily concerned with just how bad ideology infects uh, the presentation of education in the public realm, right? The check marks and all these and the politicians and other and the, the leftist academics, right? Uh, and so I, I tried to I tried to provide as uh, informed and knowledgeable, of a kind of counterpunch to all that is possible. So, yeah. Well, I, I love that your realm is education. I think that that's every frog and every person in our area has an area of expertise. And I think you're the only one that I know of that's covering that education sort of sector. And I think it's really important. And I really, I, I love the idea that you have this fathers and sons classics things coming up. That sounds like a great um, <clears throat> way to fight back in, in a way. Yeah. Doug was, uh, Doug was the guy who originally planted the idea in my, my mind about that because uh, he had, he was looking for 
Look, I mean, there's a lot of guys in our orbit who, you know, they do, they, they're they very big on the homeschooling stuff, which I'm very big on myself. And the question is, you know, how do you really get parents involved with this kind of stuff? And I mean, it just immediately jumps out when you think about it. It's like, what are the kind of books that a father would want to read with his son? And what are the kind of books, for instance, that a, I don't know, a mother would want to read with her daughter? I mean, I don't, I don't even attempt to touch that. But uh, but I've got the fathers and sons thing covered uh, because, as I like to say, uh, there would be we could we could just about fix, uh, you know, 95 percent of all the problems currently destroying our culture daily uh, if we had better fathers. And so that's that's one of, that's always been my big thrust about education is that if you fix the father situation, uh, you're going to fix the education situation, you'll fix the culture situation, you'll fix the. I mean, just uh, everything starts to get fixed, but yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I think we could, we could talk so much about this and we could talk about all the cultural things, but I, I think I would prefer to dig into some text here and, and then let uh, all that other stuff kind of come out of what we're talking about. And so what I wanted to do, what I've asked uh, Athenian to do with me here is to go through five different chapters and we'll see how far we get. If we run out of time, we obviously don't have to do all five, but five chapters of Thus Spake Zarathustra, of course, by Nietzsche. And in my view, the greatest book ever written by a human being. I mean, I think, you know, religious people, really religious people have this sense of like the Bible and then every other book. That's how I feel about this book. I feel like Thus Spake Zarathustra, and even with regard to Nietzsche's other work, to me, like he gets to a level here, he mixes poetry and philosophy in such a way that he, to me, achieve, actually succeeds in describing the meaning of life, which is like, seems impossible, but, but he actually, as far as I'm concerned, like this book actually does that. And I know that you uh, have talked a lot about this book and I know we share a mutual love, deep love for Nietzsche. So I thought instead of, you know, just broad strokes, maybe let's let's like get into some of the specific things he says and uh, we can kind of analyze it and go from there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so so on the passages that you sent me, um, we can go in any order that you want to. I just sort of started with a chronological order in the text because uh, one of the things that's that one of the things that one has to keep in mind with Nietzsche is that um everything has a place and everything's in its place. So uh, he, he said, it's funny, he says on numerous occasions uh, that uh, to lead an author by the nose is bad form, which is something I think everyone is always guilty of, right? Uh, when we, when we, when we quote uh, someone oh, yeah. right yeah. out of context or something like that, it's like, well, wait a minute, uh, that might be in the middle of a larger ar argument. That might not even be him speaking in his own voice. He might be speaking in someone else's voice. Uh, all these things come into play. So Yeah, well, unfortunately, we're going to be doing a little bit of that here because we're not going to read from the beginning. So we're... Yeah, we're no, no. I mean, you have, to. Yeah, you, yeah, you have to. Yeah, you have uh, to. But yeah, so that would mean us starting with Of the Friend, right? Because that, is that the first one that, that I sent? Or which so, one? Yeah, it's right before uh, Thousand and One Goals. Yeah, yeah. So Of the Friend. So the only... The, the ones that we're going to go over are Of the Friend, which is about... Just a quick summary. Of the Friend is about friendship, male friendship in particular. Uh, of Thousand and One Golds is about, it, which is, I think, really one of the key chapters of the whole book, is about uh, <clears throat> the creation of values in with regard to different peoples. Uh, of Old and Young Women is another one that we're going to talk about. That's just about women, straight up. And then the last two are... Um, of the compassionate, that's where he says God is dead, although I, I'm sure, as you'll be able to tell us, he said that before, but I think of the compassionate does, does a good job of explaining what he means by that. And then also we'll be talking about um, of great events, which I included that one because this that one's like so tough to understand what he's talking about. I think the other ones are like a little bit easier, but that one's just like so hard to, to parse what he means because he's it's just so weird. But yeah, I mean, if you think we should start with Up the Front, let's do that. Um, I have like a little section. I mean, should we just read the whole thing? I have a little section highlighted that I could read, or do you think we should just read the whole chapter? 
Um, I found that what happens when we when we read the whole chapter is it will we'll end up spinning forever because <laughs> it <laughs> actually it actually turns out taking a long time to read. Uh, yeah. One thing I would say just real briefly though about this, uh, and it always has to be said, is that everyone, well, a lot of most people who like Nietzsche very often don't even end up reading Zarathustra because Zarathustra is a very complicated text. However, it simply has to be understood that Nietzsche understood all of his publications prior to Zarathustra as directing people towards reading Zarathustra and all of his publications after Zarathustra to be pointing back, uh, saying, go back and read Zarathustra. So Zarathustra uh, is by far the most important of all of Nietzsche's writings, according to Nietzsche, that he published. And that just really, really has to be emphasized because so many times I see people that uh, want to stay with reading the more uh, treatise-friendly approaches like Beyond Good and Evil or Genealogy, Morality, Antichrist, these sorts of things, uh, which is, which is, I mean, look, hey, it's great, you know, you read Nietzsche, uh, but I'm, I jokingly say that I'm something of a purist. Uh, so anytime people talk about something in Nietzsche, my immediate response is, well, hold on, where can we find it in Zarathustra? Where do we find the theme in Zarathustra? So so just something for your, your listeners to keep in mind. Uh, it is the work uh, to focus on the most, I think. Yeah, awesome. Well, good good to know. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. So what do you think we should do here? Should we just read some of this or should we just talk about it? Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and read uh, whatever passage you had uh, in particular? I'll just try and go quickly because you're totally right. I mean, I've never done anything like this before, so and I'm sure you have. So, so we, I, I will follow your lead. So, if this starts to get long, uh, we can stop. But I'll just try try this little passage. So he's talking about friendship, and he sees this hermit, and he, so Zarathustra comes across as a hermit, and. Um, or he's talking about hermits in general, and he's saying that a hermit gets lonely and he has this desire for a friend. And he says, our faith in others betrays wherein where we would dearly like to have faith in ourselves. Our longing for a friend is our betrayer. And often with our love, we only want to leap over envy and often we attack and make an enemy in order to conceal that we are vulnerable to attack. At least be my enemy. Thus speaks the true reverence and th th that does not venture to ask for friendship. If you want a friend, you must be also willing to wage war for him. And to wage war, you must be capable of being an enemy. You should honor even the enemy in your friend. Can you go near your friend without going over to him? In your friend, you should possess your best enemy. Your heart should feel closest to him when you oppose him. Do you wish to go naked before your friend? Is it in honor of your friend that you show yourself to him as you are? But he wishes you to the devil for it. He who, make, he who makes no secret of himself excites anger in others. That is how much reason you have to fear nakedness. If you were gods, you could then be ashamed of your clothes. You cannot adorn yourself too well for your friend, for you should be to him an arrow and a longing for the Superman. Have you ever watched your friend sleep to discover what he looked like? Your friend's face is something else beside. It is your own face in a rough and imperfect mirror. Have you ever watched your friend asleep? Were you not startled to see what he looked like? Oh, my friend, man is something that must be overcome. The friend should be a master in conjecture and in keeping silence. You must not want to see everything. Your dream should tell you what your friend does when awake. May your pity be a conjecture that you may first know if your friend wants pity. Perhaps what he loves in you is the undimmed eye and the glance of eternity. Let your pity for your friend conceal itself under a hard shell. You should break a tooth biting upon it. Thus, it will have delicacy and sweetness. That's what I've got. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. So there's a lot there. Um, one of the first things that sticks out to me is that uh, people reading this should know that the, the theme of friendship and philosophy has a, a very long tradition, very important tradition. Nietzsche's bringing it back because it had fallen out of favor for the most part. Uh, Montaigne was essentially the last one who really talked about friendship. Um, and, and then it disappears with modern philosophy with all this talk of epistemology and everything like that. Uh, but Nietzsche brings it back. And what we have here is a new understanding of what Aristotle referred to as the, the friend as a second self. 
in in this particular case, uh, he he encompasses all of this in a number of different ways. Uh, first of all, there's the longing to even have to have a friend. Um, so, so there's that issue of whether or not, at least according to Nietzsche, a man is by nature a political animal. Um, because remember, solitude is a new virtue for Nietzsche. Uh, that's where he finds Zarathustra when he recovers like the phoenix is all alone in his cave. Uh, so there's something about being alone uh, that's important. And, and and also, does Zarathustra have any friends uh, throughout the text? Um, I mean, he has his animals, but can we say that those are his friends? Um, and also, uh, this very, very important issue of the enemy. Uh, what one has to realize is that what he's saying here is that you should, well, he's saying a number of things, but your, your friends which is to say are going to be encompassing of what you would consider to be an honorable enemy. Um, so in that regard, enemies have to be earned and they speak just as much about you as your friends, because in that respect, they are your friends. Nietzsche famously says that, well, he can't stop talking about Plato, not because he hates Plato, uh, but because he sees in Plato so much that he does like, uh, that he could be friends with and could wrestle with uh, for ideas and things like that. So that's what I often like to tell my friends on Twitter, and we're all guilty of it. I mean, my God, I'm guilty of it. Uh, we we sometimes demean ourselves by choosing poor enemies, enemies that are not worthy of us. It's like, would you would you would you actually consider that person a friend under other circumstances, or are you or are you honestly wasting your time on the timeline arguing with a moron? <laughs> uh, you just would never like under any condition. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. And I think he says that kind of in the beginning where he says, at least be my enemy, thus speaks the true reverence that does not venture to ask for friendship. Like it's saying, <clears throat> it, 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 like the same passion we feel for a friend is the same passion we have for a, a good enemy. You know, it's like, like if you're, if he's kind of saying like, if you're insecure, you yearn for a friend, but sometimes because it's easier, you make them an enemy because you feel something for them. I feel like. Yeah, that's, that's actually worth pausing over because one of the things about our orbit on Twitter is that we often are so isolated uh, because a lot of times more mainstream doesn't want anything to do with this for whatever reason uh, that we end up fighting amongst ourselves. Uh, and that I think there's a lot of that going on. Oh yeah. Uh, here is that, you know, but 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 also um something something that occurred to me is that uh notice he says um he says for the translation I'm having right here, and I don't particularly like this translation. I mean it's not I mean it's the best of the worst, I guess. Uh, but he says, For your friends, you cannot groom yourself beautifully enough, yeah, yeah. or you should be his arrow and longing for the overman. Yeah. Yeah. So so the way that one is to conduct oneself with one friends has this teaching of pity encompassed within it, uh, which is to say Nietzsche is very, very much against pity. Yes. Uh, yes. Pity is going to turn out. Pity is going to turn out to be, uh, if not the uh, pillar upon which everything for Nietzsche revolves around. Uh, it's one of two. Uh, I like to say that love is the other one. Uh, and we'll get to that if we get to um, once we get to the on women part. Um, but but that's the thing is that. It does no one any good to be their shoulder to cry on. Right. Yes. As a friend, right. You, you are supposed to show the kind of strength uh, that you would want to see for the overman right I mean, yeah. that's in so, your so fronts the, exactly yeah exactly yeah. exactly yeah. so in that regard uh your friends say everything about you your enemies say everything about you uh and we see it it's all coming back around to this thing he's he says the overman right it's the the whole history of uh and we'll get to this with a thousand one goals the whole history of humanity uh is tied up uh to looking forward to this new human type uh, and this teaching of compassion, this teaching of friendship, uh, all of these things, even the solitude itself uh, as a virtue, all of these things come back around and point singularly focused upon this one thing 
that he has in mind with the overman. Yeah, I think it's so, God, the reason why it's like so deep is he's writing this, you know, how a hundred years, hundred however long, 20 years before Netflix. And he's describing, at least as far, as far as I understand it, he's reacting against this notion of male friendship, of vulnerability. And it's, we see this vulnerable male friendship character in every awful feminized Netflix film. You know, every single man, it's like, oh, I love you, man. Like, let's like really be vulnerable together. Like male friendship is about vulnerability and really being able to be ourselves around each other. Like be your, your friend is somebody you can be yourself around, right? And he's saying, no, he's saying, actually, male friends should barely know each other. He's saying, like, don't be naked in front of your male friends. He's saying you should present yourself as beautifully as possible. And also, like, when you're thinking of your friends, don't seek to know them. Don't seek to, like, know their sleeping selves. Imagine them as these magnificent creatures. Yeah, one thing I would I would add to that is um, there's also this the question of what constitutes manliness is there in this in this essay as well manliness is very very important for nietzsche as well as as a virtue uh, precisely because what you say uh, he did see uh, this effeminate uh, gynocracy as we now see it today he saw all of these things coming and uh, a good friend of mine uh, on twitter tommy bagels i love that guy he's so fucking funny uh, he points. He pointed this out to me one time too, uh, because this is what this is. Tom, Tom, he's possibly the funniest man on Twitter, oh, yeah. uh, and he he loves to like uh, take shots at you on uh, on your comments and stuff. Uh, and you know, and I, I I just love. He's so funny. I, you can't help but love him. And we were talking about it one time, and and he said, you know, um, I mean, it's just like the military. But he's sort of a military guy. And he's like, it's just like the military. I mean, that's what friends do. I mean, they they break and build, right? I mean, yeah. that's how real men joke around yeah. by uh, effectively sort of taking shots at you. And I think that's exactly right. I mean, that's how uh, uh, part of my own biography here is that I would never have turned out to be the person that I am were it not for my own best friend um, when I got wrapped up dating this incredibly beautiful woman that I just sort of, I became that guy, right? The one that disappears from all his other friends. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, it was horrible. And and he disowned me. In fact, uh, he flatly disowned me. Uh, and he would send me a text like once every couple of weeks and be like, do you still have a dick or is it turned into a vagina? <laughs> like, does it turn into a full-blown vagina yet or what? Yeah. Uh, and so he was able to pull me back in. Uh, and it worked. Uh, it, it worked. And I, that's one of the best things I have to thank uh, him for is that that's that's how guys should conduct themselves this sappiness of uh you know guys you know crying or, or what have you i mean look i suppose rare instances uh but that's nietzsche nietzsche does not or nietzsche zarathustra absolutely does not have that in mind because the whole point uh, of manliness or the whole point of friendship in many ways is a furtherance of this project of the overman yeah how do you further right. it well, you you live it, right? You live what you want the overman to be through yourself so that you can be the target that other people will be, will be aiming for because no one ever knows uh, what their influence is. Nietzsche is going to refer to this as his shadow. Uh, no one ever knows who's watching, right? Because we don't necessarily know, right? So when Jordan Peterson opens up these video things that he does and starts sobbing like a girl, uh, he could be... He could be influencing these young kids, you know, that might be suffering with depression and they see him crying and they're like, you know, well, he's he's a manly guy. You know, he talks about fighting. You know, he says that, you know, there's a lot of Anons out there that talk big, but they're not. So he's obviously he's a courageous guy, man. And he cries. It's OK. Uh, you know, he wears these funny looking blue suits, with these, uh, you know, that don't even go past his knees. And you know, it's fine. It's fine. Right. So so all of that is what Nietzsche's friend or Zarathustra's concept of the friend is meant to weed out in everyone's everyday life. Uh, and I think that that is extremely healthy. Yeah. It's what it's wanting your friends to be strong. You know, perhaps what he loves in you is the undimmed eye and the glance of eternity. It's, 
you know, it's it's trying to remove the indulgence of pity from friendship. And because it's just this toxic, evil thing that destroys the project of seeking the overman, which seeking the Superman, which is what we should all be engaged in, you know, and and, and that's bettering each other by being hard, you know, by being hard with each other. Um, I also think it, you know, it, it also kind of to me. The other side of like contemporary male friendship that is also soft and weak is this notion of like the ride or die friend. Like uh, we all have this this idea that, oh, like, uh, yeah, you know, we have co-workers and we have we have uh, like people that we collaborate with on this and that. But really, like our ride or die friends, they don't give a shit about any of that. And they're going to be there for us when it's time to bury the bodies. Or if I really need help, that ride or die friend who is not involved with me in the project of betterment or making money or, you know, bringing about the overman, whatever, that that person is going to be there. Right. But have you ever tested one of those relationships? I've tested those relationships many times. They're never there. <laughs> that, that person, that person that you think that is the ride or die, like they're not going to give you a job when you really need a job. They're not going to actually come kill somebody for you. So I think what he's saying is like, don't expect that. Like you, you should, a friend is somebody that you are engaged in the pursuit of greatness with. That is what your friend should be. Not this, like, I think that our society atomizes friendship to the degree where it's like your ride or die is somebody that is necessarily not involved in destroying, you know, progressivism with you. Right. But in my opinion, all our friends should be involved in this same project and you shouldn't yeah. even have friends outside of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's really worth pointing out there that because that brings up the issue of the meaning of virtue for Nietzsche. Uh, people think that simply because Nietzsche traffics in nihilism that he can't have or he does or he, he doesn't have. Uh, a very strict understanding of what virtue is, which is to say greatness, excellence. Yeah, yeah, excellence. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is no way in hell that Zarathustra would have a friend that would wrap him up in something so petty, you know, that he would have to, I mean, look, it's one thing to go, you know, bury the body of a worthy enemy. Right. Uh, yes, exactly. Know, yeah. It's it's something else entirely to go bury the body of, you know, some, I don't know, some Hooker. people that you <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, these these right. these things were, are never going to happen. Yeah, uh, exactly. For, exactly. For, for Zarathustra or for Nietzsche. Nietzsche, in fact, Nietzsche even says at one point uh, that I refrain from listing my own virtues because they would break most people. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how that's how strict he is about these things. So and, and that that gets lost. Uh, a lot of that gets lost. Uh, because uh, people are so afraid of nihilism that uh, they'll just do anything. They'll, they'll they'll do anything to quickly explain Nietzsche away, dismiss him, uh, trash him. Uh, there's that guy that keeps attacking. It's that guy that keeps attacking Bap. Uh, that he just lumps Bap with Nietzsche and then just randomly quotes Bap, or ra I'm sorry, randomly quotes Nietzsche, uh, and then says why it's wrong with all these references to the Bible. And I'm just, I, I look at that and I'm like, I'm like this. I mean, first of all, that's that's not even 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 when Nietzsche is saying that, that's not exactly what he means. Uh, and in many cases, he's attacking those people that you talk. It just it's it's so it's so laughable uh, because people want so desperately to to defend their what Nietzsche would call their ascetic ideals, um, and when Nietzsche has ascetic ideals, they're just different. <laughs> they're just yeah. they're just radically different. So. But but anyway, I just I had to throw that in there because oh, that, yeah. that's always that's always the first thing that comes up with nihilism. That's always the way so-called polite society hates talking about Nietzsche is because uh, they think that it's just going to be this degenerate kind of a human being uh, who has nothing to stop him from doing whatever is whatever the deepest longings of his soul at the vulgar level are. There's nothing to stop him from doing that. So he's automatically like what Plato would refer to, Plato Socrates would refer to as the tyrant. Um, but yeah, anyway. So. No, but, and he's, it's funny because he's so the opposite of that. You know, he's, he's actually asking so much more of us than, 
others. You know, it's like he's not asking us to do nothing. He's asking us to actually have a much higher standard, I think, than other people. So it's funny that people think of him as a nihilist. I don't even really know why that is, to be honest. But why do people think that about him? Well, I mean, he certainly is a nihilist, but uh, the question is, how deep does your nihilism run, right? Uh, what is what is the significance of, uh, you know, this is why I've been doing that whole series of spaces. I just started a whole series of spaces on nihilism because um, what Nietzsche is arguing for is a noble under What can be salvaged in the face of nihilism? What, what about the beautiful or the noble can be yeah. salvaged in the face of nihilism? And this far into the text, at least, of Zarathustra, part one, uh, certainly what can be salvaged is this new type of human being called the overman. Um, now, other things are going to arise throughout the text in part two and part three uh, that are going to complicate things. Uh, but that's that's to say that there is still this fundamental understanding of, um, well, think of it this way. The study of philosophy has always been grounded primarily around this thing called phusis, it's the Greek word for what we get the word physics for. The Latin translation is nature, the study of nature. Um, that's always been what philosophy has been most concerned with. Nietzsche is going to have this understanding of nature, and this will come up in the discussion of, the, of women. Nietzsche has an understanding of nature that it is a kind of fundamental flux i mean in that respect he's he's heraclitian in a sense that's why he has such esteem for heraclitus uh the question though is what's the what's the status of that fundamental flux you know is it guilty right is it a kind of uh is it is it a kind of like a sin an original sin or is it fundamentally innocent uh and what nietzsche is going to say is it's fundamentally innocent because it allows us to create these new things we call good and evil. Um, and the way in which we can create them now with full consciousness of the, of the status of nature as this innocence of being, we can now finally, for the first time in all of human history, this is literally the next chapter. Yeah. Yep. Thousand and one goals. He says now for the first time in all of human history, we can, properly fit a goal to this thing we call human being because prior to this we've never really understood what nature is so we don't know what human nature is and without a proper understanding of human nature we can't properly give goals uh, to to good and evil or what he calls uh the the tables the table of the, the values right? yeah, yeah exactly yeah well, well but when you say before we do that when you say he's a nihilist he's definitely a nihilist what do you mean by he's definitely a nihilist like what because nihilist just means that nothing has any meaning right or maybe i don't understand what that means well there's there's the vulgar understanding of nihilism which is to say well here's the thing and this is what I really try to bring out in those spaces is that it, it's difficult to give a definition of nihilism because uh, it manifests itself in so many ways. The, the, one of the most important ways that Nietzsche defines it is well, that he points to it is he says that man has simply become weary with man. Uh, this is the, this is genealogy morality. And he says, what is nihilism? If not that, uh, which is to say that the vitality of man now in the wake of modern science and how it so you know ruins the sacred truths, uh, man no longer has an understanding. Man no longer knows what to believe, and so he becomes uh, spiritually the the sort of person described in the Bible as lukewarm, right? Uh, that God would spit out. And so the question is, how do we revive that vitalism, right? What can we give it that spark for? Uh, this is going to be the image that he gets from Heraclitus with the Persians and the bow. Yep. Uh, we, you have to be able to somehow harness that tension that's in your soul. And he's, this, he says this in the, uh, when he introduces the overman uh, in, in the text, you have to find a way to harness the tension so that you can shoot your arrow of longing to, to, to further shores. Uh, but the way things stand right now is that in this wake of not knowing what to believe, 
man doesn't have any force behind his saying yes and his saying no, right? It's like, well, I mean, sure, I guess, I don't know, I mean, maybe, right? Sure. Uh, and and what what Nietzsche is trying to say is that you can you can still know that there is a fundamental flux to all things that that human beings have always been the ones who assign value to things. You can still have that and uh, have this vitality of life. Now that's a tall fucking order. Okay. I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Wow. That was actually a really, really good explanation of nihilism because I'd always thought I see exactly what you mean. Yeah. And, and he's, cause he's beginning with the starting point of nihilism, which is the loss of belief or the recognition that man creates all these things. Right. And then what is that? That is basically nihilism because you're saying that none of it actually is metaphysically important. It just is created by man. And that is a nihilistic belief. And then he's like, well, beginning with that, what are we left with? You know, how do we still find meaning? Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, this is this is also going to be where where Heidegger has his strongest critique, because Heidegger is going to say that Nietzsche himself was the culmination of the metaph metaphysical tradition and yeah. in fact and right. in fact yeah. does still have a metaphysics yeah. now for, for nietzsche uh nietzsche that would be you know it, it, incomprehensible because he he would say well what do you mean i have a metaphysics i don't even have a nature the, i mean the word nature occurs in this text zarathustra exactly one time uh and it's in the context of the poets uh, and there he's holding it up as saying something that is a kind of uh, not so much a fiction, but it's an opportunity. Uh, and this is. So Wait, but that, what is nature? Sorry to interrupt. What What is why is nature significant? I'm missing. I'm missing that part. Right. So so nature is, again, going back to the the philosophy of it all is this word phusis. Okay. Uh, and that's where we get, for instance, Aristotle's metaphysics. Right. Uh, Aristotle's physics, um, all of these things, it, this thing we call nature is what we get when we look at things that are not made by man. Okay, yeah. yeah Think yeah. of, for instance, a tree, right? Yeah. A tree grows, it has some kind of inner, inner principle of motion. Yeah. Uh, and so everything that we think of as nature is going to be the various attempts to, to really articulate what this inner source of motion is, uh, and then we get into, you know, the discussion of Aristotle's forms that lead all the way through the medieval period. Uh, and then we sort of get rid of them at modernity and we have uh, the mathematization of nature. Everything becomes atoms again. Uh, and then even that falls apart with Kant. Uh, we can't we have no access to things in themselves. Yeah. yeah then yeah. you have Schopenhauer and then Nietzsche. Uh, and this is by, basically uh, for your readers who are curious about this. This is going to be the section in Twilight of the Idols. Uh, called How the Real World Became a Fable. Uh, and that's really what's going on here is this long tradition and history of trying to give an articulation or an account of what we mean when we say nature or human nature. Uh, very, very relevant even for today, right? Because what is the nature of a man? What is the nature of a woman? Uh, and what Nietzsche, Nietzsche's nihilism uh, is emphatic that uh, nature is fundamentally always in change. There's no cardinal distinction between any between a human being uh, and any other organic material, or even perhaps inorganic material. Uh, but the the issue is he goes further than that, right? Uh, that's when the the act of the creator, as we would yeah. say, places his stamp on this fundamental flux, and the stamp is going to be precisely these values, the, 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 the one additional value of the thousand and one goals, right? The, the one new goal is going to be what he places on there. Uh, well, okay. So let's read what I'm not, I don't totally get the one, Why, but let me just read this little passage for it. So this is literally the next chapter. So it's perfect that we can't stumbled across this anyway, uh, from the chapter we just read. <laughs> and it's, I'm, I'm totally unclear why, this one follows of the friend because they seem unrelated to me, but let me just read it, this little passage from it. Um, so Zarathustra has seen many lands and many peoples. Thus he has discovered the good and evil of many peoples. Zarathustra has found no greater power on earth than good and evil. 
No people could live without evaluating, but if it wishes to maintain itself, it must not evaluate as its neighbor evaluates. Much that seemed good to one people seemed shame and disgrace to another. Thus I found. I found much that was called evil in one place and was in, was in another decked with purple honors. One neighbor never understood another. His soul was always amazed at his neighbor's madness and wickedness. A table of values hangs over every people. Behold, it is the table of its overcomings. Behold, it is the voice of its will to power. What it accounts hard, it calls praiseworthy. What it accounts indispensable and hard, it calls good. And that which relieves the greatest need, the rare, the hardest of all, it glorifies as holy. Whatever causes it to rule and conquer and glitter to the dread and envy of its neighbor, that it accounts the sublimest, the paramount, the evaluation, and the meaning of all things. Truly, my brother, if you only knew a people's need and land and sky and neighbor, you could surely divine the law of its overcomings and why it is upon this ladder that it mounts towards its hope. So then from here, so basically he's laying out the fact that every people is defined by this table of values that hangs above it. And this table of values is dictated by the things it cares about, the things it needs and holds holy. Then this is like my favorite part, one of my favorite parts. He lists examples of four great peoples through history. And he describes the like single table of values that makes each of those peoples great. So he don't, I think he goes Greeks, Persians, Jews, Germans. And it goes, you should always, you should always be the first and outrival all others. Your jealous soul should love no one except your friend. This precept made the soul of a Greek tremble. In following it, he followed his path to greatness. So that's the Greeks. To speak the truth and to know well how to handle a bow and arrow. This seemed both estimable and hard to that people from whom I got my name, a name which is both estimable and hard to me. Obviously, Zarathustra is the god of the Persians, so he's talking about the Persians. To honor father and mother and to do their will even from the roots of the soul. Another people hung this table of overcoming over itself and became mighty and eternal with it. That's the Jews. And then, you know, honor their mother and father. And then he has to practice loyalty and for the sake of loyalty to risk honor and blood, even in evil and dangerous causes. Another people mastered itself with such teaching and thus mastering itself became pregnant and heavy with great hopes. That's fucking incredible. Like totally, you know, calling Hitler before Hitler even existed because that last group is the Germans, right? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is it's um, it's it's not immediately clear that that last group is the Germans. I think oh, is it not? I thought it, it, it says in my footnotes here of this translation that that's the Germans, but I don't well, know. How well, true. there's a, I mean, I'm not saying it's not, but I, I will say that it's very disputed uh, in the scholarship because uh, it could very well be that what he's, that all of these are pre-Christian. Um, it could be the case that he's giving um, the Greeks, the Persians, um, the Hebrews or the Jews, uh, and then the last one could be the uh, the Romans. Uh, oh, and okay. and if Same. if it's if it's the case that that's true, then he would be following in the footsteps of someone that he is a very big fan of, uh, which is to say Machiavelli, uh, because this these four groups are exactly who Machiavelli lists in uh, the Prince uh, Book Six, oh. um, and so. So there, so great. I'm talking. I'm so glad we're doing this. And, yeah, and that's, then, that's that's cool. Yeah, and then there, the founders are, are particularly important, right? You've got, uh, you've got. Uh, let's see, I'm I'm drawing a blank just because, but there's he lists Moses, uh, Romulus, Theseus, uh, Theseus, uh, and and Theseus in particular is important because of the mythology that gets attached to him. So that would that would account for the imagery, um, but. But let's back up <laughs> before we go too far there. Yeah, um, so so one of the things uh, that you don't really see in the translation is the title itself, A Thousand and One Goals. Nietzsche breaks protocol with this particular title, the way that he lists it. Uh, in the German, thousand and one is traditionally one word. Uh, you combine them all together. Uh However, Nietzsche breaks protocol and he emphasizes, he separates the one. Uh, so it's, he makes it the three words. In German, the one word, thousand and one is all one word. Uh, but he breaks it up into the three words. And that's not typical whatsoever. 
So he's emphasizing that one right there. Um, and so what needs to be really seen is happening here is that uh, when he says all peoples, he's talking about the history of all mankind. So what Zarathustra is carrying on his shoulders here as a kind of new atlas uh, is the weight of all mankind. And what he's saying now is that up to him, uh, we've had these thousands of different peoples, uh, but now, uh, now we can finally have the one last people oh. that's going to, as it were, uh, yoke all the necks of all the previous peoples together uh, and make one people. Um and you really see this come out uh, in one of the passages from when he first talks about the death of God. Uh, and I'll, 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 this, I'll be doing the, this in my series of spaces, but on nihilism. But in one of his earliest references to the death of God in Human All to Human, he points out that in the wake of the death of God, the first immediate consequence is an entire global world order. And so what Zarathustra has in mind with these, with this new goal, this new one at the end of all the other thousands uh, is to be this world order. Um, and I mean, it, it's, it, it, it takes on, you know, the tones of, you know, well, okay, well, what is this new world order to do? Well, obviously it's going to be the, the overman and what have you. Um, but, but, but just the imagery itself of what he says there, I mean, I was <laughs> When I was reading this, me and you were messaging because like we were both sort of on fire just rereading the passages. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I mean, just think about that. When when you think about you as a people uh, and how it is that your, your customs, your ways uh, are just a tablet. It's just a tablet of good and evil that represents your overcoming, right? And, and in this respect... Uh, good and evil or the tablets represent the camel right the from the metamorphoses of the spirit right uh to to fundamentally be this sort of camel um and what's happening here with this new one is, is obviously zarathustra is introducing in his own speech effectively that he's the lion to tear up all these <laughs> all these <laughs> thousand <laughs> tablets uh and then what's he going to do uh, then he's going to implement the imagery of what comes after the lion, which is the child. Uh, and what is it about the child? Uh, well, the child is creative. Uh, the child creates the new tablets for the new people. So the process of the metamorphoses of the spirit is made into world history at this point uh, for Nietzsche insofar as not, there's not that there's a teleology involved. There certainly is not, but what is happening is that the understanding of the overman uh, has become such that uh, he recognizes that throughout all of world history, all of these people must themselves be overcome. Yeah, uh, dude, and, so cool. I, yeah, this, and this, so, yeah, sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that what he's saying is that world history itself has been emblematic of the camel. Uh, and then he is introducing uh, in the act of the overman uh all of them right uh the overman yeah. having carried these things then as the over uh, as the overman being the lion tears them up to pieces and then as the child uh creates this new tablet of of good and evil for for people to follow by the camel you mean the like a beast of burden correct yeah right because right? right. yeah because he says right, at right. the end here I've always wondered, like I, you just totally gave me the key to understanding. The, but the last part of this is something I, I'd never understood, and it's impossible to Google. So, to, the, this ends by saying, truly, the power of this praising and blaming, so good and evil, is a monster. Tell me who will subdue it for me, brothers. Tell me who will fasten fetters upon the thousand necks of this beast. Hitherto, there have been a thousand goals, for there have been a thousand people. Peoples, only fetters are still lacking for these thousand necks. The one goal is still lacking. So it's like we have this image of one fetter, which I guess is like a harness, right? That exists on top of all these other thousand goals that a thousand peoples have had. And we're going to unify that into like one for humanity. 
Yes, I think that's what's that's exactly what's going on is that this new this this last goal, the one of the the one that gets added to the all previous thousand uh, is the yoking of all world history yeah. all, and, and not just world history, but all peoples. Right. So all current peoples of the world uh, into this this globalization, um, but not as we understand it. This is thoroughly as Nietzsche understands it. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, was it, is it this chapter? Oh, I think I might be thinking of the one on, uh, the one on, uh, women, well, uh, yes. but that's where he discovers will to power. That's the first occurrence of will to power, uh, in, in the text. Um, but, but, but that will, that will, that will come back to that one at, at some point or, or the reader will come back to that. <laughs> um, but, but also again, I think, uh, he points out, is it, is it this one where he has where we also see resentment? Uh, resentment comes up. Uh, in which one? In the, in this one we just read? Yeah, I think I'm actually I I, I think I over prepared and I'm juggling. No, in my, okay. I'm no, getting no, no, things no, no. I'm getting things juggled in my mind. No, right we're now. getting deep in here, man. This is it's, <laughs> a, it's impossible to follow without without uh, you know. Um, oh, that's that's what it is. Yeah, because uh, so he mentions these four peoples, uh, which yeah. is fascinating, right? And whether or not you know who these correspond to, that's you know that's a, a hot topic. Uh, but he's also going to mention peoples again in part two uh, yeah. on the tarantulas, and that's oh yeah, 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 and things get really interesting because he makes it perfectly clear he's siding with the Greeks. Uh, and that's clear also from this chapter too, right? Because just the imagery of the beginning, many lands Zarathustra saw and many peoples, uh, that's Odysseus uh, from the Odyssey. That's the opening lines uh, of Homer's Odyssey. So uh, Nietzsche is presenting Zarathustra as a new Odysseus. Uh, and also when he speaks of the Persians there, he simply says, these are the people of whom I get my name. He doesn't associate himself with any of any particular people. So yeah. it look it looks as if so 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 the the mystery of Zarathustra only grows deeper, but at the same time he makes it perfectly clear that he's siding with the Greeks, um, and that's that's also right that that passage that he quotes for the first people, uh, he says always you shall be the first uh, and tower above others. I mean that's that's Peleus's advice to Achilles uh, in the Iliad. Uh, oh, wow. is, and he's always going to be coming back to that. That's always uh, that that defines the agon uh, or the contest for Nietzsche, uh, and that also uh, explains the previous chapter of the friend. What was the purpose of the friend? Uh, to be the one that others, that your other friends strive to be, right? So everyone is sort of in this contest, uh, and I think uh, as a as just a tentative suggestion here that what we see with the friend and then the immediate transition to thousand one goals is the individual is being writ large to the political community because notice what he says there too uh he points out the individual himself is still the youngest creation oh yeah yeah, yeah. so and, and, and it's always important to point that out that individuality is not necessarily a good thing for nietzsche he has great criticisms for it because he's no fan of modern liberalism uh, and so Nietzsche would always say, uh, okay, you're an individual, but individuated from what? Who are your people? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, do you just exist uh, with no people? What's your, what's your, what's your tradition? What's your past? What's your, what, who are you, who are you associated with? Right. Uh, because he has great criticism for commercial society in general, because he says it grinds people into sand. Mm. Uh, he's, he calls it atomistic culture. Um but again, uh, I don't want to deviate too much from the, the text. Uh, well, no, you're saying something really interesting about the herd versus the individual and the individual being the latest thing. But then it's like, isn't the child who comes after the breaking of all these herd values, like, you know, all these individual values? He, yeah, he basically says, um, <clears throat> yeah, he says, like, joy in the herd is older than joy in the ego, like, the original creators of things were not individuals. They were, they were groups. They were, you know, your people was the creator, not the individual. Then the individual is the newer thing. But how does the individual then differ from the child? Like, 
because I would agree, like, certainly he would not be in favor of individualism, probably. But like, what does he then mean if we're going to destroy the table of values, all these tables of values with the lion, and then the child comes next? What is the difference between the child and the individual? Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, no. We're, you, what, what's happening is we're touching on, again, this great problem in Nietzsche of how it is that you're supposed to have foundations, foundationalism. Right. Uh, when in fact everything is in flux. And so uh, what, what I would say is that what's going to happen is that the overman is going to be this unique thing. Uh, he's going to stamp that table with good and evil in such a way that it's going to have the kind of friendships, promote the kind of friendships that we saw in the previous chapter and so long as people are striving towards that, uh, that's good, right? Because here's the thing with the overman. Uh, the overman is not what anyone in particular makes of it. The overman is always and only what Zarathustra makes of it. So what we see happening with his disciples throughout the text is that, and this goes back to this concept of the shadow he talks about, um, is that uh, Nietzsche is... Nietzsche Zarathustra, I should say, is not so much concerned with the ways in which the overman is arrived at. He's more concerned with the fact that the overman is what he think, what he teaches it should be. Right, that's the crucial thing. Uh, the mean, the ways in which one gets to the overman uh, really is almost irrelevant. Uh, but it's uh, it, it's important that the goal be definitely what Zarathustra sees the goal as. And so that's the, and it's going to, it's going to show itself with these, with this new teaching of, of good and, and evil. Uh, and, and so then the immediate question is, okay, so, you know, we, as readers, we, we sort of want to be at the back of the book and say, okay, what's this new thing? What's, what's it going to be? What's the, what's the answer that's going to keep us together and not yeah, all, right. all become, what, what's going to make us all be camels instead of yeah, all individual yeah. lions that tear everything up right. uh, and create our own values. Uh, and that's where one has to really come to terms with uh, what all that is involved in the overman, which is to say the various qualities that Nietzsche is going to associate with virtue. Right. Uh, virtue is what defines uh, the thing, because uh, notice just in this chapter, uh, how do you establish virtue? Well, he tells us it's praising and blaming. Um, but he says that that's all he says. He says it's an incredibly powerful thing to praise and blame, right? We're not allowed to do that anymore uh, because that's the teachers of equality that, that he'll address in the tarantulas uh, chapter. Um, that's the primary thing of modernity that he hates, uh, these teachers of equality. Uh, yeah. But but yeah, the, 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 the fact is, uh, the fact is that it has to be, there has to be an enormous amount of praise and, and blame brought into things but at the same time, he recognizes that that's a monster, uh, precisely because what we get in modernity is uh, well, it's not even a modernity. It's 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 alive in that question of the herd, right? That Nietzsche points out. Because what happens if the herd is led astray? Well, they'll still continue to be this monstrosity of praising and blaming. Uh, they're just praising and blaming the wrong thing, right? Uh, and then you know, how do you right the ship again? Uh, but 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 what what we're touching on, what you're wrestling with here, is effectively the the fundamental political question in in Nietzsche, which is to say, how do you how do you arrive at a goal and then keep everyone at that goal without everyone becoming their own understanding of you know the lion or the overman to tear things up and say, well, uh, I have a thousand and two goals now, no, <laughs> right? We just sort of add one more to it. Um, but I think that speaks to why he says that uh, they have to have shackles around the necks of all the people, right? Uh, what we're what we're seeing with the shackles around the necks of all the previous people, uh, that's will to power. Uh, and so the overman is going to have such exemplary will to power that you're not going to get these these deviations that are going to bubble up as uh, individual lions that tear up you know the tablets and create their own new things. Now, whether or not that's possible, uh, that's the question, right? Because, uh, I mean, just scroll down my timeline and see how some of the academics respond to uh, 
some of my Nietzsche tweets is they'll say Nietzsche couldn't do it. Uh, they say he just can't do it. Um, and he does, he does kind of balk uh, from it. And in fact, there's textual evidence to, to even support that he balks from it. He says so in, uh, in genealogy morality, he says, he says, I've talked too much. He says at this point, I need to leave it to someone younger to a Zarathustra, right? So he's pointing back even in genealogy morality to Zarathustra and saying, uh, it's not, it's not for me, Nietzsche, to say how to get this done. Uh, go read my Zarathustra because, and this is something that my good friend Justin brought up uh, a few times in some of uh, the spaces he's attended that I've, I've hosted on Nietzsche, is he says that it's not immediately clear that Nietzsche thought that this was even humanly possible because, I mean, just, I mean, just think about what all's involved in creating not just a new people, but a new people that effectively harnesses the entirety of all world history and the globe, the globe as it currently exists. And if we make it to the last chapter, we'll talk about, I think he, he refers to this thing that that group, that new world is um, sort of, ex he calls it the sky at one point, he calls it gold at another point. And it's like, it's very hard to understand what that thing is, that that group is going to be governed under or governed by, like what they're connecting to, what the overman is connected to. And you're right, I don't think he understands, he or not understands, I don't think he offers really the how or the what that that looks like, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. He just kind of like says it's this like golden thing. Yeah, you know, the, the way that I like to describe it is that Nietzsche can be tentatively broken up into two things. There's diagnostics and prognostics. Yeah. Diagnostics is nihilism. Uh, he has to shatter. I mean, let's never forget the subtitle of, of the book is uh, for all and none. So there's something about Zareth, there's something about the 19th, the late 19th century that Nietzsche recognized no one. He had no disciples. Uh, that's how powerful nihilism was and the herd mentality and what have you. And so on the one hand, Zarathustra has to uh, break that grip on the world. And then on the other hand, he has to offer something to, to take its place. Yeah, right. What he offers to take its place seems to be this, this overman. Now, that remains sort of vague. Yeah. Uh, but what we can say, at least, is that his thorough, thorough destruction, the dynamite aspect of what Nietzsche is, uh, is his dismantling of the thousand goals prior to the thousand and first, right? That's what keeps popping up over and over again. That's the last man. That's that's the teachers of wisdom, right? That's the marketplace. That's all of these chapters are so wonderful at describing that and, and, and powerful. Uh, but getting to what we're aiming at, that that's, man, that, that's that gets... Tough, right. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, and just so people understand, the tarantula chapter is about basically the people who hate strength. And I, I don't know exactly where they fit in or which one of these, you know, if they're one of the thousand existing beasts or whatever. But they, it's, you know, uh, for justice speaks thus to me, men are not equal. I do not want to be confused with these preachers of equality or taken for one of them. And I think that maybe that fits in. He's basically saying, do not become one of these people who hate strength and who want revenge over the beautiful. And that maybe, and I, I guess I could ask, in the nihilism of the destruction of the tables of values, pity is the most dangerous regression. It's the most dangerous place we can go because it's in a way like, it, it's a tempting place to go once all of those values are destroyed. And that's kind of like, what he's warning against in the of the tarantulas chapter is is that accurate yes yeah, sorry i'm having a, a dog issue right now no 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 worries. but 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 hold on uh yes <laughs> so so the issue <laughs> tarantula. uh the issue and now motorcycles outside uh the issue with the tarantulas and and, and you're you're correct uh the most dangerous thing of all is pity yeah, is regret. And that's where we'll go without any understanding of how to get to a better place via the the, the Ubermensch. We will regress to pity. Right. And and which is what's happening, which is literally what's happened to the world. Like that is if you look around you, everything is pity. Everything and, in our current society is a regression to pity. 
Yeah, and keep in mind what 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 gets said in that chapter on the tarantulas about uh, the teachers of equality is that pity always issues. Uh, pity is a guise. Uh, it is a guise to hide will to power, uh, because the problem with this pity or compassion uh, or equality, as they say, uh, is that um, it sees that other people are getting more, and it gets resentful about it. And so, how? So, so there, the the practice of equality is really is really just a very passive aggressive form of will to power. Yeah, uh, it's it's the weak, the weak exercising the only kind of strength they have. And what, what if you're a weak person? What's the only strength you have that you can exercise? Well, you can virtue signal and show that to the world that you have pity for other people. You can sob over Ukraine. Uh, you know, you can sob over over blacks. Yeah. Uh, you can sob over all these things, right? It's just it's unbridled pity, which is nothing more than a thin veil. Yeah. for your resentment uh, that your power, your will to power is not up to the task uh, of overcoming uh, something, something greater. Right. Yeah, totally. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on uh, to the, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to read the tarantula chapter, but we are going to read another one in part two, if we, if we can move a little quicker here. So, um, and that's not to say you move quicker. I'm, I'm enjoying this and I could talk about this, you know, we could just go down the path, but let's just kind of keep reading these. And we want to talk about this women chapter because it's just so vicious. <laughs> it's just so hilarious. Like anybody just needs to read this chapter because it's just so vicious, but um, all right. So I'm just going to read it. Um, and I obliged. Okay. So he runs across a little old woman and the woman basically says, Hey, why don't you ever talk to women? And uh, he goes, oh, you know, I don't, I, I, I forget what he says, but he kind of dismisses her. And then uh, she goes, oh, come on, t talk to me about women anyway. I'm old enough to forget it, which is kind of hilarious. And then he says, okay, fine. Everything about woman is a riddle and everything about woman has one solution. It is called pregnancy. For the woman, the man is a means. The end is always the child. But what is the woman for a man? The true man wants two things, danger and play. For that reason, he wants woman as the most dangerous plaything. Man should be trained for war and woman for the recreation of the warrior. All else is folly. The warrior does not like the fruit that is too sweet. Therefore, he likes woman. Even the sweetest woman is still bitter. Woman understands children better than a man, but man is more childlike than a woman. A child is concealed in the true man. It wants to play. Come, women, discover the child in man. Let woman be a plaything, pure and fine like a precious stone illuminated by the virtues of a world that does not yet exist. Let the flash of a star glitter in your love. Let your hope be, may I bear the Superman. Let there be bravery in your love. With your love, you should attack him who inspires you with fear. Let your honor be in your love. Woman has understood little otherwise about honor, but let this be your honor. Always to love more than you are loved and never to be second in this. Let man fear woman when she loves. Then she bears every sacrifice and every other thing she accounts valueless. Let man fear woman when she hates. For man is at the bottom of his soul only wicked, wicked, but woman is base. Whom does woman hate most? Thus spoke the iron to the magnet. I hate you most because you attract me, but you are not strong enough to draw me towards you. The man's happiness is I will. The woman's happiness is he will. Behold, now the world has become perfect. Thus thinks every woman when she obeys with all her love. I just want to read that again. Behold, now the, the world has become perfect. Thus thinks every woman when she obeys with all her love. And woman has to obey and find depth for her surface. Woman's nature is surface, a changeable stormy film upon shallow waters. But a man's nature is deep. Its torrent roars in subterranean caves. Woman senses its power, but does not comprehend it. Then the little war old woman answered me, Zarathustra has said many nice things, especially for those who are young enough for them. It is strange. Zarathustra knows little of women, yet he is right about them. Is this because with women, nothing is impossible? And now for acceptance, thanks, a little truth. So she's offering him a gift. I am certainly old enough for it. Wrap it up and stop its mouth. Otherwise, it will cry too loudly. This little truth. Give me your truth, woman, I said. And thus spoke the little old woman. Are you visiting women? Do not forget your whip. Okay. All I right. Mean, it's, fucked so, up. it's fucked up. It's definitely like very harsh. But what is he saying here? 
Yeah, so um, so this is one of the chapters in Zarathustra that you, if you blink, you miss some of the most significant details that are being said there because uh, this is not Zarathustra talking with an older woman. This is Zarathustra talking to a disciple about having had a conversation with an older oh, woman. Right? Yeah, so yeah. even that, right? Because notice what he says. He says, indeed, my brother spoke Zarathustra. So he's talking to another one of his disciples. Um, and also. Uh, oh, the, yeah. Wow. So he's recounting this like secondhand. This is not. Right? A lot. Yeah. OK. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And and something else is that he speaks to an old woman and she says, look, I'm old. Uh, you know, just talk to me about this stuff. So what does he talk to her about? Well, he talks to her about things that are of interest of for, for men of younger women. It has nothing to do with being an older woman, right? So so he's he's found a way to to get this teaching about women uh, to his disciples from an older woman without ever having had to get his hands dirty I, I guess we could say with like talking to e-girls or something like that right? <laughs> uh, and that's what she's noticed right what what is it that the older woman has noticed uh, it's that he doesn't talk to women she doesn't see him talk to women and it's not just that uh, she knows that he has a surprising amount of wisdom about women without having had too much apparent interaction or experience with them um now, there's a number of ways to interpret that, but I think what it's coming back around to is that uh, this is an understanding of uh, of of will to power again between the the, the sexes. But but also um, this this question of woman and man, uh, he never he never doubts. He, he never doubts either of them. People are men. People are women. Uh, that's not. A prejudice of his day he's not simply soaking in the fact that late 19th century germany took it for granted that men and women are the same because what distinguishes man from woman well human nature uh so so there's and and what have we already found out about nature is that it's fundamentally in flux right that's the whole point of the thousand and one tablets is that uh there is no fundamental substance to things yeah so so why why is it that that Zarathustra wouldn't even quibble with the fact that there simply are men and there are yeah. women. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's going to be the aspect, I think, uh, of his teaching on a very, very important virtue, if not the most important virtue for Zarathustra, which is gratitude. Uh, what he says about the nature of being itself is that it's thoroughly innocent. And what we have with this teaching of men and women my, my dog is going crazy in the background. But what we have with this teaching of men and women is being grateful that nature has given them to us as that. Um, and so what is it that characterizes the nature of man? Well, it's just that he wills, right? And this is, again, we're going to see will to power come up as the most important thing. Uh, and what is the characteristic of woman? Uh, well, it's that she appreciates that man wills. Uh, her joy is in the fact that man wills. Um which is to say no alpha women. <laughs> right? uh, and, and there's also, by the way, this, uh, this issue of uh, Machiavelli is also front and center again here. Uh, what, and, and I just want to emphasize for your readers, this is not an arbitrary interpretation. Nietzsche himself is the one who tells us that we have to read more Machiavelli, uh, that he hasn't been understood enough. Uh, and Machiavelli famously closes the prince by using the imagery of uh, how does one conquer fortune or chance? Uh, and he says, well, chance is a woman uh, and she favors the young man. And sometimes you have to you have to you hold her down and strike her. Uh, and so when when Nietzsche Zarathustra relays that when you go to the woman, don't forget the whip. Uh, that's the imagery that he has in mind there is that. In order to continue being grateful for the way that man and women have been given, to, have just sort of occurred to us through this chance of nature, in order to be grateful for it, we should be grateful for it. Uh, we have to hold it in check, uh, keep it in its place. Uh, otherwise, you'll get uh, Mike Obama uh, <laughs> or uh, Venus Williams or something like that. 
Um, but but also also worth pointing out here, or right, AOC uh, and uh, who's that? Ilhan Omar, right? These women, they talk real big, but then you kick them off a committee, and what do they do? They they break down and cry. Yeah, uh, they cry in front of the Capitol, or they cry in the Capitol, right? I, tw I tweeted that the other day. It's just, I it's like, has there ever been? so many crying leaders before you know yeah. like has any society ever just had yeah also the new zealand woman like resigned yeah. the other day she's just sobbing <laughs> it's like yeah, like what the fuck <laughs> it's so absurd it's like what what is going on and that's just supposed to be like normal it's like oh yeah no problem everybody's just crying all the time you know it's completely normal yeah and one thing before i forget is um it's not zarathustra that says don't forget the whip it's the old woman uh, the old yeah, woman of course of course no i mean yeah he's he's bare, but that's the secret she gives him right it's yeah like, and, and, and also uh, one of the main images i left out there was uh what does the woman say the old woman says that zarathustra is carrying he's hiding something he's carrying it around uh and that's when the audience here becomes important right he's only talking to one other disciple so he's 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 this is not a public teaching uh, this is a private teaching between uh, him, between Zarathustra and one other disciple. And it's addressing the fact that Zarathustra seems to have uh, literally something up his sleeve, right? She says, you've got, you carry something around with you. You've got, you're hiding. What, what is that? That little, you've got a child there. Uh, what is that? And, and let's never forget the imagery of the child, right? The child is the, is the, is the act of the creative will, Creator, right? uh, the yeah. innocent creative will. And so uh, it's recognized, somehow it's been recognized that Zarathustra, this very talkative, garrulous person, is not sharing everything. Uh, and so he's been called out by someone who said, hey, uh, I know there's more to you than meets the eye. What's your, you've got some kind of uh, secret uh, teaching there or something. Let's, uh, <laughs> now let me, let me take a look at that. Why don't you uh, pull your, pull your cloak back a little bit. Let me see what you got there. Uh, and so that's, his, that's Zarathustra's child, right? Uh, and, and I would just emphasize that the, the reason that this chapter is so incredibly important for the whole of Zarathustra is that what Zarathustra does, the, the text of Zarathustra, what it, what it really is, is it's a love story um, between Zarathustra and two anthropomorphized things. Uh, there are two women. On the one hand, you've got life. And on the other hand, you've got wisdom. And Zarathustra is in love on the one hand with life, but he's also in love with wisdom. Um, but he has to make a choice, right? He can't have them both. And so Zarathustra's understanding of how to treat women becomes that much more important precisely because this text we call Zarathustra, which is, let's always remember, Nietzsche is always talking about life affirming versus life denying. Uh, he's always attacking the academics. Uh, he has to decide, Zarathustra has to decide between science on the one hand, uh, university science or something, uh, and life on the other hand, uh, which is to say he has to decide between truth or illusion, uh, the illusion of truth. But he uh, chooses life, right? He chooses life, which is going to require, uh, uh, apparently Plato's noble lies were never really gotten rid of. Uh, this is uh, this comes up quite explicitly in uh, untimely meditations where he talks about the fact that people need illusions. And that's the, actually, you know, we don't even have to leave the text. Uh, what did we just mention about the tables of good and evil? They're creations. In other words, they're illusions. Uh, they're not real. They're just what we put them on. Uh, the, the only political question about them is how to make sure that they get instilled so that people do believe them, so that people do understand them as that which has to be overcome. Uh, and that's going to be the key right there is that uh, Nietzsche is, in fact, saying that his Zarathustra has some kind of teaching that is a bit hidden, that he's only going to reveal to particular disciples. Uh, and it's going to constitute uh, the most important or the key to unlocking uh, his relationship between these two women he's in love with, which on the one hand is life uh, and on the other hand uh, is wisdom or science or what have you um but but that's a lot that i said there and i no I, no no i i think you're you're doing a great job of uh, illustrating that and I've, I've never thought of the spake in that way and i think you're completely right that that's what it ultimately is about and the love side of it is actually something that i haven't thought that much about and um yeah i we could talk about this all day i think uh 
Yeah, that, that's why, by the way, he starts Beyond Good and Evil with that claim. He says, literally, the text says, uh, he says, what if truth was a woman? Um, so so this is the issue of of Eros and Nietzsche. That, that's what we're getting at. And he's going to have, a, a, let's not be mistaken, he fundamentally differs from Plato, uh, although he has these things of noble lies or what have you. But then again, Zarathustra has his own understanding of what's noble, what's great, right? It's not what Plato thought it was. Uh, so again, uh, the, the yoking of the thousand people beforehand, but still uh, a siding with the Greeks. Um, now, of course, it's going to be a Homeric Greek. Uh, it's not going to be a Platonic Greek. Uh, but then you have to ask yourself, to what extent do these things differ and to what extent do these things have similarities, uh, these kinds of things. But but yeah, anyway, I've, I've rambled so much because uh, oh, I was oh, I was trying oh. to unpack like what I think is so incredibly important there. And um, while at the same time uh, being aware of our time constraints. And No, I think you nailed it. I mean, I think it's also, as you said, it's very fascinating that this, that little piece of knowledge and that one is like hidden for some reason, you know, it's like, that's, it's not one of his proclamations. It's something that people have to kind of like squeeze out of him, which it seems really meaningful for some reason that this is like a secret key that's really not like for everybody you there yeah i mean it, he he mentions that it, it it cries too much right or or no the, the woman says be careful that it doesn't cry too much uh so 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 this teaching yeah uh, itself is a kind of overcome a self overcoming right uh there's there's something about the teaching that really wants to get out that really wants to be heard uh, but how do you control something like that? Uh, well, you have to overcome it. Uh, and also the, the older woman says, apparently, uh, one thing to help you overcome it is don't forget the whip, which I interpret as him saying is, is Nietzsche hilariously uh, having this older woman instruct him to go make sure she make sure that he doesn't forget to read Machiavelli. Uh, go, oh. go read your Machiavelli. Um, so, yeah. Um, Anyway, uh, so very much to be pulled out from there. Uh, That's but, but, so fascinating. Uh, Don't forget your whip. Why is Machiavelli the whip? Oh, because that's what Machiavelli's teaching is about women, is that you have to hold them down and strike them if need be. Uh, and for Zarathustra to do that, the imagery is simply of using the whip. Uh, he uh, Now, there's a little bit more that's going to come tumbling out of that imagery of the whip later on. Um, but But that's how he... He he the, he uses the imagery of his wild wisdom, which is to say, science as as Zarathustra loves it, is very wild. Uh, it likes to get out of control, and so how does he have to control that? Well, he's going to have to take the whip to that one. Uh, and life herself, uh, there's this wonderful dialogue between the three of them, sort of at the middle of the book, uh, that's hilarious um, about jealousy and what have you one of the women gets jealous the other women's trying to play coy um and it, it's this interplay between life and wisdom or science or what have you and you know to what extent does one have to give up one or how do these things overlay right uh, we call people theorists uh, who sit around and read books all day who are really smart but then we ask them to post physique uh, and they're a twink, right <laughs> uh, this is the most obvious uh, sacrifice that very often has to be made uh, one has to simply decide, look, uh, am I going to, you know, devote the time needed to learn Latin and Greek? Uh, or do I still want to live life, right? Go to the gym, right? So sun my balls, uh, <laughs> things like that. Get out in the sun, sun my balls. Uh, these kinds of things are, are, they're real issues. I mean, because this is something I constantly struggle with because I do like to take fitness extremely seriously. Uh, but I also take, you know, education very seriously and honest to god there are times when you can literally bury yourself with every moment of free time uh in your books for weeks on end and and still feel like you haven't done enough uh meanwhile your gains you've lost all your gains right it's like fuck i gotta go back and start all over so it's it's you know nisha has all of this in his mind here uh, with these kinds of things, uh, not to reduce life to working out or anything and being muscular. That's not all what's going on there. Uh, but, but, but it's something that's at least, uh, people can sort of recognize, uh, with or relate to at least. Yeah, totally. Um, all right. So I think we'll, we'll skip over the, um, we'll skip over the, of the compassionate because 
I think we've very well established. He says God is dead in in that chapter, but he said God is dead before. And I think we've established what he means by God being dead. And it's all about the risk of pity. He says, you know, uh, God is dead for his pity of man. And I think what we're, you know, the the thing that we're saying there is, this is what I always tell everybody about Nietzsche in general and, and our world in general, which is that pity is actually the most animalistic thing humans do, in my opinion. Like we have this notion that our pity makes us bigger than animals. But actually, I think what Nietzsche would say is our pity is our most animalistic, dark, natural instinct. And without other things pushing us away from that, all we'll do is pity. And I think if you look at the world and communism and, you know, the racial Marxism we're in now, uh, that is a condition of pity. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot being said there. Um, w- w- the way that I would describe it is that I'm, I'm undecided about this myself, because like I said, you know, sort of the two twin pillars of of Nietzsche's thought always come back around to this thing called pity. And then this other thing called love, but I'm not so sure that they can be separated because uh, remember Zarathustra comes down from the mountain. uh, And one of the first things he says is I love man. Uh, So his love of mankind uh, is, is this new understanding of, of pity that, that Nietzsche has or, or Zarathustra has. So it's, it's different in, in kind. Uh, because, uh, and, and remember, he keeps coming down uh, at various times from the mountain because he wants to save his teaching or, or something, something's gone awry. There's, and, and the whole purpose of the teaching is for mankind, right? Because he has this love of mankind. Uh, so he's, he's vehemently not, for instance, Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer gives up on man. Yeah. Uh, his skepticism and he just, he, he's, Schopenhauer would be, would be perfectly fine uh, being the hermit up in the cave and never coming back down. Yeah. That's not Nietzsche. Uh, he's separated from that. Um, but he does, he does see this thing that, that you've rightly called pity as being the most dangerous thing precisely because um, it's going to end up being the, the kind of engine that drives the transformation of all values, right? One either has the proper love of man like Zarathustra and, and can transvalue all values, right? Revalue all values. Uh, or one can have the misunderstanding of pity, which is to say Christianity, um, yeah. and stay stuck down in the weeds with the last man. See, that's what the last man embraces, Yeah, uh, is this love of equality. Yeah, uh, And it's just, it's nothing, pity is nothing more, the, the Christian understanding, at least according to Nietzsche, the Christian, Christian understanding of pity is that it's nothing more than a passive aggressive uh, yeah, form will of will to warped, power. Warped will to power. That's exactly, that's, uh, exactly. All, all screwy and weird. And and I mean, this is what the precipice of the fight that we're, we have. This is literally what we're doing. You know, we're, we're, we're dealing with a world that has been completely overtaken by exactly the last man that he describes. <laughs> who are who are completely driven by this pity instinct in every way, which is this strange warped will to power that's not a direct will. It's you know he talks about the cloudy skies, you know it's it's this clouded you know destructive force because it's so unpure. And then yeah, you know, we have this these few of us who somehow are we're living in the world past the thousand tables. Basically, I mean, it, that's what we're dealing with. And this is why it's so funny, because we're we're talking about globalism all the time. And what is globalism? Globalism is literally what he's saying. It's the the destruction of every yoke and the replacement with a single yoke. But the the fight is what that yoke is going to be. And is that yoke going to be pity, this vague notion of individual atomized pity, or is it going to be something bigger than that? And I, I think that that's like what we're fighting. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Uh, I mean, all the way across the board there, because um, for for Zarathustra, uh, one could say that what's happening uh, is that we're living in the twilight of God's death. 
Yeah, um, right. And so what he's saying is that, you know, this the last man wants to continue living this way uh, precisely because he, he no longer understands what greatness is. The nihilism that has led up to the death of God and pervades after the death of God is precisely a, an inability to understand human greatness, human excellence. They've had this misunderstanding of what nature itself is uh, that's, you know, presented them, that's defined their various good and evil, the goal to think, to be overcome. Uh, and getting past that is so very difficult be, precisely because, uh, I mean, when you're born into something uh, and you grow up through it, you don't even realize how much it's infected you. That's why I laugh and I, I, I say that so many of these people, especially uh, like the trad cats and stuff like that, uh, they want to attack nihilism as if somehow they're not already infected by it. Yeah. Uh, which is laughable because we're all infected by it in various ways. I mean, it's trying to get out of it that's so absolutely difficult or or not even out of it, but overcome it, right? To be able to refocus uh, that tension that's already there in the soul, uh, but refocus it towards a, a goal that's worthy of of us, right? Um, to keep us from becoming, you know, the beetle that hops uh, of the last man yeah okay uh I, we we have a very short period here and i just i have to i have to ask you about this because this is like this chapter i feel like i just i'm like scratching at the surface of it so uh we'll just take this last uh little bit here and i'll i'll just try and read this so this is uh of great events um and it's about this fire dog so Zarathustra goes and he he like he's going down to hell basically and he has to pass through this volcano and in passing through this volcano he comes across this thing that is translated as the fire dog and I don't know if there's a better translation for that somewhere but I don't know what a fire dog is but he's talking about it so he he talks to this fire dog and again remember that this chapter is called of great events so he's talking about like great events in history the uh <clears throat> the earth he said has a skin he said about what the fire dog said and this skin has diseases one of these diseases for example is called man and another of these diseases is called the fire dog men have told many lies and been told many lies about him to fathom this secret i fared across the sea and i have seen truth naked truly barefoot to the neck now I know all about the fire dog and also all about the revolutionary and subversive devils, which not only old women fear. Up with you, fire dog, up from your death, I cried, and confess how deep that depth is. Where does it come from, that which you snort up? You drink deeply from the sea, your bitter eloquence betrays that. Truly, for a dog of the depths, you take your food too much from the surface. At the best, I hold you to be Earth's ventri ventriloquist. And when I have heard subversive and revolutionary devils speak, I have always found them like you, bitter, lying, and superficial. You understand how to bellow and how to darken the air with ashes. You are the greatest braggart and have sufficiently learned the art of making mud boil. Where you are, there, where you are, there must always be mud around and much that is spongy, hollow, and compressed. It wants to be freed. Freedom, you all, freedom, you all most like to bellow. But I have unlearned belief in great events whenever there is much bellowing and smoke about them. And, <clears throat> and believe me, friend, infernal racket, the greatest events, they are not our noisiest, but our stillest hours. The world revolves not around the inventions of new noises, but around the inventors of new values. It revolves inaudibly. Uh, and just confess, little was ever found to have happened with when your noise and smoke disperse. What did it matter that a town had been mummified and a statue lay in the mud? And I say this to the overthrowers of statues. To throw salt in the sea and statues into mud are perhaps the greatest of follies. The statue lay in the mud of your contempt, but this is precisely is its law, and its life and living beauty grow again out of contempt. And now it arises again with diviner features and sourfully seductive, and in truth, I it will even thank you for overthrowing it, you overthrowers of the statues. I tender, however, this advice to kings and churches, to all that is weak with age and virtue. Only let yourselves be overthrown, that you may return to life and that virtue may return to you. So I could keep going here, but we should probably stop and just, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, think I know. I think I know, but I'm sure you know better, probably. No, I mean, he, he named it there a second ago, um, 
the reactionary. He's talking about the political reactionary, the revolutionist. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And, overthrowers. Yeah. Right. And what he's, I mean, I mean, <laughs> what's so amazing is that, uh, you know, we're literally living through the overthrow of throwing of statues uh, that people yeah, I know. celebrate. Yeah, uh, and so, so we get to live through this ourselves and see what he's saying. He's saying that these people, that the the events of world history, they don't turn around these things. Uh, yeah, these right. these yeah. people are just you know these blowhards. Uh, they make the most noise, but they're not the ones for whom the events of the world actually turn. And it, he says, uh, I mean, he uses various imagery, right? That the the things happen with just a whisper, right? The real changing of events in world history happen with just a whisper, right? We never see these things. Uh, we simply think that we recognize them in these great events, you know, because uh, everyone just, the herd, right, jumps on this. Uh, it's always so easy uh, to attach uh, great significance to something that seems great. Um, and yeah. what Nietzsche is saying is, uh, what well, what Zarathustra is saying is that these people are just opportunists. That's all they are. Yeah, it's uh, smoke and smoke and thunder, but nothing actually there. And and the real significant change happens in the quiet, not with these people constantly trying to get us to overthrow things. Right. And and what I would say yeah. is, what is I mean, just to sort of really connect this to the text? Uh, what is the what is the most important event that has happened in the entire text that we've uh, that was completely silent? Well, it was Zarathustra in his cave. Uh, yeah. It was Zarathustra being able to rise like the phoenix out of his ash uh, in his solitude. Uh, and there was literally nobody around. Uh, he did it all on his own. Uh, and then he comes along and he will he will change world events. Nietzsche famously says in his second untimely meditation that if he just had 100 guys that read Plutarch, he could take over the world. Uh, because Plutarch teaches about human excellence. It turns out that Nietzsche didn't even need anyone. He did it himself. Uh, so the entirety of world history has been changed uh, through Nietzsche. And let's be very, very specific here. This did not happen in his life. Nietzsche did not receive any uh, yeah, right. credit or fame whatsoever in, in his own life. But he had such an understanding for the change that he was affecting and his understanding of the history of the West and particularly philosophy, et cetera, that he knew uh, that the revaluation of all values takes place uh, always in the areas that people least see it occurring. Yeah, in the darkness, in, in the working. Right, right. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Yeah. And just one last thing to point out there. Uh, the thing about uh, this, there's also some uh, a revaluation going on here as well. Um, because notice what he says, uh, the firehound is at this, is at the center of the earth, right? In the volcano. Uh, and he says, uh, let's see, Zarathustra says, I know that the center of the earth is gold, right? Yeah. Well, no, hold on. So that's where we're going in a second. And I, I think that that's the absolute perfect place to end because this is him. I'm pretty sure what's happened. So, okay. We get to the point where we just at. He's basically labeled the revolutionaries as annoying. Then he says the church, and he says the church is the same thing. Get out of here. He kind of it says, fire dog, you know, you're a hypocrite. You know, you you think all these, like you, everything, you speak out of the belly of things. Um, like he's speaking like fire in this like bad substrate from the center of the earth, right? And then at the end, he says, let me speak of another fire dog, which really speaks from the heart of the earth, not the belly. He's saying the heart. His breath exhales gold and golden rain, so his heart will have it. What are ashes and smoke and hot mud to him now? Laughter flutters from him like a motley cloud. He is ill disposed towards your gurgling and spitting and griping of the bowels. Gold and laughter, however, he takes from the heart of the earth, for that you may know it, the heart of the earth is gold. And then he says, when the fire dog heard this, he could no longer bear to listen to me. Abashed, he drew his tail and said, bow wow, and a small voice and crawled it down into his cave. <laughs> right. So, um, so, yeah. <laughs> so the most important thing to keep in mind there is that 
um, what he's referring to is what he mentioned when he first introduced the overman long ago in the prologue. He said, I teach you the meaning of the earth. And what is the meaning of the earth? It's the overman. Yeah. So this political reactionary guy uh, who thinks yeah. he knows what the meaning of the earth is, uh, is absolutely wrong because what the meaning of the earth is, is the overman. That's why it's golden. That's why it speaks from the heart. Uh, there was also something else that spoke through the belly, right? And that yeah. was being itself. Uh, that's when he trashed the, the tradition of metaphysics. He said, being only speaks uh, to man uh, at, through man, right? Through his belly. He says the belly of being. In other words, it's just an aspect of man that's simply hungry. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's it's a very, and not just hungry, but a biological kind of thing. Uh, and so uh, Zarathustra is bringing everything back to the biological. Uh, he's bringing everything back to the bodily. Uh, and he's saying, he's giving it something new. He's saying, look, uh, this stuff you're talking about, this is just like a hunger. Uh, what I'm teaching you is uh, a kind of golden center of for your own heart, right? For for your soul, which is none other than the meaning uh, of the earth, which is the overman. And the uh, heart of the earth versus the belly of the earth. I feel like right, it's right. The, the better part of the earth. But but why gold? What the, like why, that's what's why is it gold? Well, I mean, I think it's just because gold is understood to be the most valuable thing. Yeah, um, yeah, right. I mean, that, so that would saying, be the yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm getting it. Yeah. yeah he, and, and and he has, for instance, like his fishing rod <laughs> with the, <laughs> later on the imagery of his fishing rod, he's got the golden bow. Right. Um, and so there's, there's that, right. And that could be playing on something like Apollo, uh, the Greek God Apollo, yeah. uh, because uh, remember the Apollonian, uh, if, if nature is fundamentally all flux, then nature is fundamentally Dionysian. Uh, and so to even offer a goal to even present this teaching of the overman you're giving uh, the impress of the apollonian on top of the dionysian uh so that's just more of a reason to associate it with gold or the the god apollo right because you know that it's really dionysian uh but you have to give it form uh and the form of the dionysian uh is the apollonian so yeah oh, that's so that's so genius it's right he's saying like yeah it's this the old fire dog is this like political creature that, that I was always telling everybody, this is so important. This is so important, but he's speaking from the hunger, the lowest part of man. Whereas uh, Zarathustra is offering, it's funny that he calls it another fire dog though. It's like, why is it another fire dog that speaks in gold versus speaks in fire? It's funny that he like, characterizes it that way. Like I'm going to teach you of another fire dog. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's just a revaluation, right? He's saying, no, that that one's been wrong. Uh, I'm going to teach you this new one, which is still the meaning of the earth. It's still the center of the earth, but it's not fire. It's not in a volcano. It's just gold. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's also something to be said about that imagery of the volcano, too, because keep in mind, uh, you always have Empedocles in the background. Uh, he was a huge fan of Empedocles. And Empedocles has the story of people sacrificing themselves in the volcano, right? So what Nietzsche has in mind by introducing this, this political reactionary uh, is that uh, he is the person who is responsible for leading all these people to sacrifice themselves. They're sacrificing themselves for a false god. Yeah. Uh, Nietzsche, and so, so by, by replacing the fire dog in the volcano, he's, he's giving, he's reintroducing Empedocles but this time, the sacrifice to the volcano is going to be worth something. Uh, it's going to be for the overman, right? It's not. It's no longer going to be for these uh, fashionable, you know, political reactionaries of the day, right? What's that? What's that one guy, Spencer? Uh, I forget his name. Uh, the the Fed guy or whatever, and he's on Twitter. Uh, the, like a wignat or something like that. Uh, Richard Spencer. Yeah, 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 Richard. Right. So, so that that fraud, right? That guy always talking about Nietzsche and stuff. He he's just the fire dog, right? I mean, oh, he's, yeah. he talks about the creation of religions and stuff. Uh, but no, like I mean, I, I mean, you can tell by his vocal physiognomy alone. It's, but whatever. Uh, but he's he's like the he's like the fire dog. Uh, and you know what what Nietzsche is saying is he's saying, look, uh, I'm offering you the real history of how things unfold, which is to say, quietly. 
Uh, and the most quiet of all of the earth shattering events that has happened is this thing I'm telling you right now, the overman. Yeah. Uh, and it's the meaning of it's the real meaning of this volcano that so many people want to sacrifice themselves for. Uh, that's the goal, I think. Totally. Yeah, that's it's smoothed out. What What is the golden bow again? And why do I know that? That's like a. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it comes up later in the text where uh, Zarathustra has his bow for fishing. It, the imagery is that of Christ, uh, that Christ goes fishing for his disciples. Uh, Zarathustra goes fishing for disciples and has the golden bow, uh, uh, like of Apollo or what have you. So. Oh, okay. And then yeah, I'd have to a book called that the golden bow. Isn't there some, why do I know of that? Oh, yeah, I'm sure there is. I mean, there's, uh, some... there's, uh, there's, I'm, I'm, there's a number of Latin writers, uh, in that, that have these things, uh, Apuleius. I, I want to yeah. say the golden bow is like a banned book for some reason but maybe i'm thinking of something else i'm thinking of like the golden thread or something i don't know anyway um so uh cool man well uh yeah oh yeah the golden bow i don't know um yeah dude thank you so much that was incredible i i am like extremely impressed that was yeah this was great i was thinking that uh i think it'd be great if we were able to do like a follow-up space and stuff like this where we could even talk about it further flesh out some more stuff and if people want to get caught up to where we're at uh, they can go back and listen <laughs> they can go to your yeah. podcast and listen hell uh, yeah man i mean i'm down i obviously i don't know how much i really have to offer besides just being interested in it but, but no, uh, no no that's you know, that's that's you. so much that's so much more than you think don't sell yeah. yourself short. uh <laughs> look we live we live at a time where people aren't interested in these things and they yeah. they, they i mean look uh, they 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 laugh out the nietzsche bros without even having read nietzsche and stuff uh so the fact that you want to talk about this in and of itself that what well, christ the fact that you've read the book uh is is enough yes yeah. Uh, yeah absolutely man i mean this is this is great stuff uh for sure man and if we do it i'll tell him i have a great uh nietzsche joke but i'll save it for our space <laughs> okay for, for other people but Sounds um good. thanks man uh oh yeah, let me yeah. and we'll put uh we, do you want to tell people where to go in any way yeah i mean look uh the 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 information is on my on my bio on twitter uh for the underground underground university website uh i haven't announced uh my my forthcoming website which i'm really going to have so much more fun with with all of the content from twitter and stuff like that uh but i'll, I'll announce that soon enough i mean probably like maybe another two weeks or something uh i haven't decided on a name i'm thinking maybe like i don't know athenian's corner or something like that but I, I don't know I'm not someone, yeah yeah I'm not, are, I'm not are, you, are you getting rid of underground university or it's going to be no no no. this is that that's it's important to keep in mind uh uh, again, that's always simply to be a website that's free of the ideology uh, of yeah. current education. So I, I don't bring my own perspective into things except to say, uh, these are the good books. This is the order you should read them in. Uh, and that's pretty much about it. That's where I keep the Substack to you. My Substack is there. Um, but but the newer website I'm doing, that's going to be like all my spaces, content and stuff like that. I'm actually going to put together like some courses and stuff, like a whole series of courses and stuff. I think a lecture series. I think it'll be a lot of fun. So. Awesome. Cool, man. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. I'm going to stop recording. All right. All right.